Today, we're going through the science of how to earthbend. Earthbending is just one of four elemental bending arts used throughout the Avatar series, the others being fire, water, and air bending. It essentially allows a person to move and shape the earth in whatever way they want. Check this Flinging boulders around, if you're not from the movie. Shooting pillars, creating rock slides, tunnels, and so much more. With stronger earthbenders generally being able to move more earth at once, and in really creative ways. So what exactly is going on here? Can we use actual real-life science to explain earthbending? I will say that this is a fun analysis of what scientific principles are at play that explain what we see in the show, rather than explaining how some people can bend while others can't. I also don't expect expect anyone to suddenly start bending rocks around, but hey, if you try it out and it works, let me know down in them comments. Now, in the past, we've talked about how air benders are actually temperature benders, controlling the temperature of parts of the air to move it around, while fire benders rely off of a chemical reaction produced between the sun, the oxygen in the air, and their own body heat. So what does it take to move a pile of dirt from one place to the next? I mean, it's just dirt, or rather soil, as dirt is defined as that leftover stain you get on your clothes after a long day of hunting grass-type Pokemon, while soil is that thin layer of loose earth covering the surface of the planet, but still, there's nothing really special about it, right? And not to mention that earthbenders were able to move not only soil, but every type of rock, stone, and oddly glowing mineral on the planet. At least the other bending types just bend the same thing. Well, after taking a much closer look at the various amounts of soil and rocks that earthbenders control over the course of the show, we can clearly see that they all have one thing in common. Literally every single one of them contain heavy metals. I'm talking about iron, lead, chromium, magnesium, copper, mercury, and not in trace amounts either. Metals are so abundant that they generally make up to 40 to 45 percent of the total composition of soil. But how is soil formed? I mean it's just there, right? It's always just been lying there outside your window as part of the literal earth. Well, while the building building blocks for soil were lying around, what we could call soil only started forming around 700 million years after the formation of the Earth, with modern soils coming into existence around 400 million years ago from the weathering of rocks. So what are earthbenders actually bending in the show? Well, what's the one thing that's common across every substance we see earthbenders bend? Metal! That's what's actually being bent, right? All earthbenders are really just metal benders, given that most of them can't bend and refined metal, which we'll get to later. Even the clay and sand we see being bent is made up of metals from weathered rocks or earth like everything else. They just contain different metals and in different amounts. Sand specifically has less heavy metals in it than soil or clay, which may explain why Toph first had trouble bending it. For the purpose of the show, we could actually define earth as just the metals it's comprised of. So now that we've defined everything we see being bent in the show as being largely or entirely comprised of earth, with earth being defined as the metals within any given substance, how are all these metals actually being bent? Honestly, the show does a pretty good job at giving us clues for how this all works. Rock is a stubborn element. If you're going to move it, You've got to be like a rock yourself. Now, you may have heard in science or geology class that Earth has its own magnetic field. This magnetic field is what affects the needles on compasses, causing them to point north. It also protects us from otherwise deadly solar winds of extremely charged particles emitted from the sun that would make life not here. This life-protecting field is also known as an electromagnetic field, a field that is generated from what is called a dynamo effect whereby rotating a magnet around a coil of wire, you can create an electric current. Or in the Earth's case, a magnetic field is created through the rotation of an electric current. An electric current that is constantly flowing through the Earth due to the swirling of the Earth's liquid metals. What's important about this is not so much that the Earth itself is generating an electric current, but the fact that an electromagnetic field can interact with other electromagnetic fields, changing them. But surely the magnet 
magnet part of electromagnetism has caught your attention, as we know that all metals are magnetic, making earthbenders masters of magnetism. Well, maybe not. Turns out that only a few metals like iron, nickel, and cobalt are magnetic, while the rest like gold, aluminum, copper, silver, and lead aren't, meaning there would be no way for earthbenders to bend a lot of the rocks around them using magnetic fields. So what then? If it's not magnetism that allows earthbenders to trust fall into the ground like it's made out of cotton? Finally! Solid ground. Then how are they bending the Earth? Well, electromagnetism can still explain what's happening, just more so the electric part and not the magnet. Remember how I said electromagnetism can interact with other fields? What I should really say is electric fields. Now thinking back to our good old science class, you may remember something called the periodic table, a table that lists all of the known elements as well as their atomic number. This number tells you how many protons any given element element has within its nucleus and how many electrons it has orbiting that nucleus. Given that the number of protons and electrons are the same, each element by itself always has a charge of zero. So an element like titanium, whose atomic number is 22, has 22 protons and 22 electrons orbiting that nucleus, creating its very own electric cloud or field. Other than opposite charges attracting and like charges repelling, the important takeaway here is that all metals love to give away electrons giving them a positive charge and resist receiving any electrons which would give them a negative charge, with the exception of receiving any electrons that would bring their charge back to zero. So how does all this science relate to earthbenders? Well, what if earthbenders are able to manipulate these charges within the earth around them, or rather generate their own electrical field to manipulate the charges of metals in the earth? Meaning that whenever we see an earthbender stomp on the ground or shoot a slab of rock at someone, they are actually generating an electrical field and forcing it through the metals in the rock. With the charges of the metals in the rock being altered to say a negative state, the earthbenders would simply place an oppositely charged electric field in the direction they want the rock to move, creating an electric gradient for the rock to move along. What earthbenders do is also known as charging by induction, which is a method that changes the charge of an object to be either negative or positive without having to directly touch touch it, simply by placing a charged object or field near the object you want to change. With this, earthbenders can create electrical currents and send it through the metal in the rock around them to move earth that they aren't in direct contact with. While this could be a possible solution for basic earthbending, what about more advanced earthbending techniques, where earthbenders are able to shape the earth into unique objects, sculptures, or anything with any amount of detail? To do this, earthbenders will not only have to change the charge of an object, and place a nearby opposing electric field, but they would have to do this at a much smaller scale by changing the charges between all of the metal atoms in the Earth to get them to come together or move apart until that life-size sculpture of bossing say is just right. Not to mention that the ability to use electric fields also explains how earthbenders are able to sense the movement of others around them. Instead of feeling the vibrations of the Earth, what they're actually perceiving is the interactions between the electrical fields fields of the atoms in the ground and in the person walking on the ground, or more specifically, the repulsion between them. And this is where things get interesting, and might even give you something cool to talk about at your next family get-together. We know that everything, including you, is made up of atoms, each containing their own electrons and thus electrical fields. The only reason why your favorite cup or your own body doesn't suddenly disintegrate into a cloud of atoms is because your atoms are being held together through electromagnetism. This is via the loose attraction occurring between the different atoms in your body. However, if an outside object were to touch you, your atom's electric fields actually repel the electrical fields in the other object. This explains why you don't suddenly fall through your chair, accidentally walk through a wall, or explode into dust when punched, because the atoms in your body are repelling the atoms in the other object. And it's this ripple-like repulsion of electric fields that earthbenders are able to sense. 
The ability to both create and sense changes in electric fields also explains how benders like Toph can tell when someone is lying. Since the beating of your heart and your heart rate is controlled through an electrical signal, whenever you lie, the rate at which your heart's electrical signal is produced increases, causing it to beat faster. And as we know, earthbenders pick up this sudden increase in electric signals pretty quick. I can feel his breathing and heartbeat. When people lie, there's a physical reaction. But this increase happens mainly due to the anxiety that comes with lying, and confident people can stop this change from happening. I am a 400 foot tall purple platypus bear with pink horns and silver wings. Okay, you're good, I admit it. Now that we have an understanding that all earthbending comes from the sensing and manipulation of electric fields, what about metal bending and beyond that, lava bending? Well, in science, trick science, this can also be explained. You see, the only difference between bending the metal in a boulder or a door is the door's metal has been refined. But what does refined mean? A refined metal is one that consists purely of a single element, as the other metals and substances have been taken out. But this doesn't actually explain why an iron door consisting of one metal is harder to bend than a boulder consisting of many metals. Well, let's first point out that metal benders aren't bending pure metal, as pure metal is generally soft and weak. This is because the lattice or arrangement of atoms in pure metal contains large even spaces due to every atom being the same size, therefore making the metal weak, easily conduct electricity, and otherwise very bendable. Metal alloys, on the other hand, which are the combination of at least two pure metals, tend to be very strong and durable. This is due to the fact that since one element has to be larger than the other, the smaller atoms can fill in the gaps between the larger ones, making the lattice or structure of the alloy very tight and strong. Wanna give it a shot? Nah, it's okay. I mean, only like one earthbender in a hundred can metal bend. Since raw earth consists of many metals that each exist separately in their own individual lattices, changing the electrical charge of the atoms to bend them is still fairly easy. However, when it comes to metal alloys, attempting to generate an electrical field to bend the two tightly woven and dense metals is much more difficult, requiring not only a stronger electrical field, but as seen in the show, one that is very precise and targeting and separating the tight bonds between the two metals. Now that we know how to metal bend, what about that lava bending? Lava bending, as you may know, is a skill that's so rare that we've only seen two people do it. And I think I have an answer for this one too. Lava, as we know, is extremely hot. But what actually makes something hot or cold? Well, the temperature of something is actually a measure of how fast or slow the atoms within it are vibrating. The hotter something is, the faster its atoms vibrate, which also causes the space between them to increase. Vice versa, the colder something is, the slower the atoms within it move and the less space there is between them. So the same rock that is molten takes up more space than if it was just a regular old rock. Now for a rock to heat up and become molten lava, rather than increasing the pressure in the rock, earthbenders would need to expand the space between the atoms, while at the same time using electromagnetic fields or waves produced produced by the field to vibrate the atoms. This is kind of similar to how a microwave works. Microwaves use a very specific type of electromagnetic field to produce microwaves. Yeah, surprising, right? And it's the specific wavelength of these microwaves that allows them to interact with the water molecules in your food, causing them to vibrate faster. Though for earthbenders, this process looks a little different. And this is where we can look at a process called heating by induction, where by continuously passing an electrical current through a metal coil, a magnetic field is created in the coil that also causes a second opposing magnetic field to be created in the metal passing through it. By having two opposing magnetic fields, friction and heat are created heating up the metal. So for earthbenders to melt rock, they would have to be able to send not just one, but two electric currents into the earth, creating two opposing electromagnetic fields. These fields would have to have such strong opposing charges that they would 
would vibrate the metal atoms so fast that they would melt and become lava. The lava could then be moved the same as regular Earth through charging by induction. It's actually this heating of rock using two precise electromagnetic fields at the same time that could be what makes lava bending such an extraordinary skill. Not to mention, the hotter the metal gets, the more electrically resistive it becomes, making it even harder to bend for earthbenders. Huh, who knew that earthbending was so fascinating and tied to real life science? If you have any wants or ideas for future episodes, let me know down in the comments below. See ya learners!